I can pinpoint the exact moment it started. It was Saturday the 12th of May. It was about eight o'clock in the morning. I was being driven by a pastor from Liverpool to Manchester. Uh, in the back seat was a man by the name of Mark. He was 25 years of age. He was part of the pastor's church's soccer team. He sat in the back. I sat in the front. I think you would call him a scouser. He was very funny. He had brothers whose name was Danny and I think Greg, and he referred to them as our Danny and our Greg. He had no possessive pronoun my, it was me ma, me da, me nan. So that he said at one point, and I noted it down, it was so good, our Danny lived with me nan. I loved that. And uh, as we got talking, he was an Everton supporter. And out of respect for him, at that moment I said, I want you to know that from now on, I also am going to be an Everton supporter. So go the mighty toffees. Oh yeah, there's a lot of response here from you. <laughs> Chelsea, Arsenal lot, isn't there? So I've been reading the paper and I've been reading for one eye out for Everton and all that's good for Everton. And you know those dreadful spurs are trying to get their hands on our manager, a bloke by the name of David Moyes. Oh, dreadful. And I've been reading about the European Championships and Group D, those dreadful French and Roy says that we're not to take the Ukra Ukrainians for, 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 great, for granted. And those nondescript Swedes, I'm reading all this, I've got to, I've just learned it. And I, so I've become an English soccer fan. And I even wrote a new Everton team song. I'm not going to try and sing that to you, but you can see me later and I'll sing it to you in private. Now, in Australia, we have an automatic saying, and the automatic saying is this, it doesn't matter. You apologise and I say, it doesn't matter. It's a cold day, it doesn't matter. The government's no good, it doesn't matter. We lost the ashes against, again to the pommies, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Everton beat Liverpool on the premiership table, it doesn't matter. England didn't make it into the final four of the semi-finals of the European Championships, it doesn't matter. It's a matter of fun. It's a diversion. It's an interest. It doesn't matter. What does matter? In these weeks on Tuesdays, we've been looking at the big questions of life. You could say every one of them matters. But today, I want to look at the biggest of big questions. Because your answer to this question will affect the way your family operates, the way your marriage operates, how you treat people when you get back to the office, what is your eternal outlook, hope and ambition? This is the biggest of the big questions. And if you have your Bible open there on page 1133, you will see very quickly what it is about. See, this is what the Apostle Paul says, but now the righteousness of God is about the righteousness of God. In Greek, in which Paul's writing, righteousness and justice are the same word. And so in verse 22, verse 21, he says, but now the righteousness of God. In verse 22, the righteousness of God. In verse 24, and are justified or declared righteous by his grace. And in verse 25, he talks about showing God's righteousness. And in verse 26, it was to show his righteousness so as to be just or righteous and the one who declares others righteous. So you have to say that here we find seven references to righteousness in the space of six verses. Righteousness is a noun or righteousness is a verb. And so this really is all about righteousness. We talk about righteous indignation as appropriate or right indignation. And righteousness as it relates to God means that God always does what is right. He demonstrates righteousness and in his judgment, he demonstrates righteous judgment. He will see the guilty punished and he will see the innocent set free. But our problem, look at verse 23, tells us none of us are righteous. We all fall short of God's righteous standard for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's why all these faith systems, every faith system you can think of gives us an answer to this question. How can I, being unrighteous, be in the right 
with the righteous God when I have an unrighteous track record? Now, friends, that is the biggest of the big questions. You say, well, I'm happy to stand on my record. It's the equivalent of a person going before a magistrate on a driving fine. And you saying, well, you've been pulled over for speeding and driving 12 or 13 or 14 times. It's no good saying to the magistrate, well, I stand on my record. Your record is your problem. Here's the question. How can unrighteous people with an unrighteous record be in the right with the righteous God? That is what matters. You say, well, who is this Paul to talk? How does he know? Surely it's just one man's opinion. Why is he so different to me? I don't know the answer to that question. How come he knows the answer to that question? Well, look at what he says there in verse 21. He says that this way, this righteousness has been manifested. He didn't think it up. He didn't discover it. It's been revealed to him. And he goes on and he says that the Old Testament scriptures anticipate it. They predict its coming. And so he can take you to the Old Testament scriptures of God and show you in the Jewish scriptures of how the Old Testament texts are pointing forward to this way in which God sets unrighteous people right with him. And then he says, look at verse 25, it's based on what God demonstrates. It's based on God showing righteousness, verse 25. It's based on God showing or demonstrating righteousness. Now, I don't know in your student days if you were ever in a demonstration, but I was in a demonstration once. It was against Australia's involvement in the Vietnam War. I sort of just got caught up in it. And what I noticed when I was in that demonstration is that the whole point of the demonstration is that it's out there. It's public. It is there to be seen. And Paul says there in verse 25 and 26 that God publicly demonstrates, he shows the way he sets unrighteous people in the right with him and that he is righteous to do it. Now, if God therefore comes to me and says, well, you've got a bad record, but we'll just set it aside, that's not righteous. He says, well, you've done, you're better more than 50% of the time. We'll, we'll just forget the times you're not. But that's not righteous because people have been disadvantaged by my unrighteousness the times I haven't done the right thing. So what do you do with a, a, a bad record? Stalin's bad record, Pol Pot's bad record, the man in the maximum security prison in London, his bad record, your bad record, the nice person who sits next to you at work also has a record that is short of God's standard. What do you do about that? How can an unrighteous person be in the right with God? We'll look at verse 22. And it's no surprise that it's all about Jesus is the answer. God demonstrates his righteousness. He shows you how he is right to set unrighteous people in the right with him through Jesus. And what did he do? Well, Paul uses three words, two words that are still in common use today. Three words that were in very common use in his day. A word from the legal world, a word from the business world. So if you're a solicitor or you're a businessman, here are words for you. And a word also that's not used today from the pagan religious world. And the first word is there in verse 24. See what he says? And are justified. There's the legal word. God, the judge, declares that you are in the right it is the pronouncement of the judge that you are in the right with the bench. And see what Paul says there, and are justified by grace, his grace, as a gift. This proclamation that you're in the right with God is undeserved. It's contrary to what you deserve. It's God's favour to those who deserve his judgment. So you'll see, here is a statement of righteousness, but immediately see it's very generous. You say, but how can God be just to declare me a guilty person in the right with him? Surely someone has to be fined. How can he do that? Well, look at the verse again. He goes on and uses his second word. And the second word is through the redemption. There's your business word that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption literally is a ransom which has been paid to set someone who has been kidnapped free. It is to free something which is bound by payment. So I go to the pawnbroker, the P-A-W-N broker, 
and I take my watch, it's my watch, I give him the watch, he gives me money for that, and a week later when I've got that money and more, I go back and I buy my watch back for myself. It is now twice owned, I have redeemed it, I have set money down to make it mine. And here we are kidnapped to what? To our unrighteous record. We are rebels, we've broken God's standards. The ransom price is the highest price, the price of a perfect life given in death. So when Jesus died, it was to, not to pay the fine for his own sin, for he had none. It was to pay the fine for our sin. He dies as a ransom to redeem me or to ransom me. And this is what the death of Jesus means to me. He dies to set me free. A perfect life is given in death. So he sets me free from the responsibility of my own record and I'm imprisoned by it. He's a substitute and God accepts that as full payment. But here is the next word. Look at verse 25. It is the pagan religious word and it is said by through whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. It's a pagan idea. You saw, if you remember that film, King Kong, where the giant gorilla comes out of the forest, he comes to the village and the people know that at his whim, he comes to express his anger against the village. And they put a young maiden outside so that King Kong can take her away. She bears the wrath of the gorilla so the village doesn't have to. It's a thoroughly pagan idea. But notice that the Christian idea of propitiation is distinct in two ways. One, the wrath of God is not the whim the wrath of God is his settled judgment, a right and perfect wrath against human rebellion. And the second thing about propitiation is that God propitiates himself. God the Father pours his just wrath on God the Son, who absorbs that wrath so that I don't have to. Now, this is what the death of Jesus means to God the Father. His death means for me that I have been set free by his laying his life down as a ransom. His death to God means that he has expressed his wrath against human sin and Jesus has absorbed that wrath so that we do not have to. Is God just therefore to set us right with him? Yes, his wrath has been expressed. The highest penalty has been required and been provided. And so when the German reformer Martin Luther was asked as a priest, do you love God? He said, no, I hate God. Because whenever he read righteousness, he saw that this was God's requirement. But now he saw that righteousness was God's provision. That which God requires, God provides. And friends, it is by grace, it is, does, it is not earned, it is not deserved, it is grace as a gift. So here's the answer. I stand before God because I've been redeemed. A ransom has been paid. I stand before God because a propitiatory sacrifice has been paid and I am forgiven. So here I am in judgment. I have a DVD of my own life. I stand before God and I'm about to put the DVD of my life into the DVD player for all the world to see. And at that moment, the Lord Jesus comes forward and says, no, play this DVD, the record of my life on your behalf. It's wonderful, isn't it? So I have therefore seen his record has become mine and my record has become his. It's like this. We used to teach people back in Sydney. Here you are weighed down by your own bad record. Here is God who is perfect. God takes your bad record and lays it to the account of the Lord Jesus who dies to pay the penalty for it. Where does that leave you? God takes the perfect righteousness of Jesus and lays that to your account. And now God sees you as standing perfect in Christ. From the college where I worked for a number of years, the average age of the student was 28. And uh, very often flowers would come to the college. Usually, almost always, they were fem for female students. One day I was walking through the office and I saw that these flowers had come and they were for a male student that college secretary said, oh, they're for one of the men. 
Now, any man, any Aussie man worthy of the name would say, oh, get rid of those flowers. I don't want to see anybody. So I went around to morning tea and I saw the secretary come round and tap Ariel on the shoulder and said, there's some flowers for you there. Now, if I were him, I would have got the flowers and run and hid them somewhere. Ariel brings the big bunch of flowers to morning tea. He's very proud of it. So I went up, Ariel, you've got some flowers? He said, yes. Oh, he said, would you like to read the card? I said, sure I would. If you're offering, I'd love to read the card. This is what the card said. Dear Ari, I trust today is a better day than yesterday. Your loving wife, Kirsty. Well, I want to know what he got up to yesterday. <laughs> but the truth is this, that Ariel is in as perfect a relationship with God today, his best day, as he was yesterday, his worst day because we stand in the perfect righteousness of Jesus. See, the Bible applies the adjective good to all sorts of things, good servants, good gift, but never to the Christian. There's no such thing as a good Christian. If you are a Christian, you're a perfect Christian because you stand in a perfect substitute, Jesus Christ. His record has become yours and your record has become his so that God treats Jesus on the cross in the way I deserve to be treated, and he now treats me in the way Jesus deserves to be treated. So the important thing is, how can I be linked to Jesus? We'll look at verse 22. And here, notice what the verse says, it is through faith in Jesus Christ. Look down at verse 25, if you would. In verse 25, we are told that it is to be received by faith. And in verse 26, the last word is that the one who has faith in Jesus. It is to come to the Lord Jesus with your record of which you cannot be proud. I cannot be proud. And it is to say, Lord Jesus, I need a perfect record and I can't earn it. I'm putting my faith in your record Please substitute, transfer your record for me, and here's my record for you. Is your faith there? And I put it to you, friends, that very often what we do is we put our faith in Jesus and we put our faith in our record as well. We blend the two together. But it's your record that's your problem. And if you're trusting in your record and in Jesus, you're not actually trusting in Jesus. Have you actually transferred your record to him? and said, Lord Jesus, that is where my confidence lies. It lies in your death. It lies in your perfect life. It lies in the fact that you have absorbed the righteous wrath of God. So we come to the shopping mall. What is the shopping mall called? It's called grace. You come with your credit card to shop. What is your credit card called? Faith in Jesus. You go to the legal firm. Oh, am I condemned? No, they say. You're in the right with the judge. You go to the pawnbroker. Oh, am I still here, captive? No. A life has been laid down. You've been set free. You go to the temple. Oh, am I to be sacrificed? No. Someone has laid down their life on your behalf. Have you transferred the weight of your confidence to him? God demonstrates his justice. It is through giving Jesus as a ransom and a propitiatory sacrifice. How can an unrighteous man like me be in the right with the righteous God? It's all because of Jesus. I couldn't have thought of that. It seems right to me that I need to make some contribution. But if you are left to make any contribution, you won't do it right. The bit you have to add won't be right. God has done it all. You can walk out of these doors today with your record and stand on your record. And may I suggest it's not good. Or you can say, I want to know more and sign up for Christianity Explored. Or you can say, right now, I want to be in the right with God. Oh God, transfer my record to Jesus and transfer his record to me. I'm going to leave soon. There will come a moment, friends, and though we think it'll never come, it will come. 
when you're about to die. It'll come. You may well be surrounded by family and loved ones and you've said your goodbyes. What is your last word going to be? Well, I tell you what I want my last word to be if I'm conscious at that point. I want my last word to be as I go into the presence of God, Jesus. Jesus. It's all about him. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father, we thank you this afternoon that there is an answer for the biggest of big questions. We thank you for Jesus. We could not have dreamt this up. We thank you for manifesting this answer to us, for revealing it to us. We thank you for his historically verifiable, perfect life. We thank you for his death as a ransom to redeem. We thank you for his resurrection from the dead as your warranty that his sacrifice is fully accepted. We are the unrighteous, that we can be in the right with the righteous God. How breathtaking is this? We pray simply today that you would make his record ours and our record his. And we pray this in his name. Amen.